The October 5, 1958 edition of the Humboldt Times in Eureka, California. Where? Eureka. Yeah, well, you don't smell too good yourself, buddy. Anyway, the front page of the October 5, 1958 edition of the Humboldt Times in Eureka, California featured a photograph of a respectable-looking gentleman holding a plaster cast of a 16-inch footprint. One of many, the gentleman in question, one Jerry Crew, had found at his job site near Bluff Creek in Northern California. The accompanying front page article related, among other things, how the road construction crew had taken to calling the maker of those footprints Bigfoot. The Associated Press Wire Service picked up the story, and on Monday, October 6th, the story went nationwide. Yes, fellow babies, October 6th, 1958, has gone down in history as the very slow news day on which Bigfoot entered the American psyche. You have arrived at Bigfoot Crossing. Good morning, fellow babies. A great day in store for you here in the metro area. But the senator, while insisting he was not intoxicated, could not explain his nudity. For hundreds of years, people from all walks of life have reported sightings of a large hairy animal walking on two feet. The scientific community has dismissed these sightings as hoaxes, hallucinations, or misidentified bears. But is there another option? Is it possible that there is an ape, the largest of the great apes, unrecognized and unclassified by modern science, roaming the forest of North America? Please join us as we seek the answer to this compelling question. You have arrived at the intersection of myth and science, of fact and folklore. You have arrived at Bigfoot Crossing. Hey, fellow babies. <laughs> Welcome to Bigfoot Crossing, the intersection of myth and science, of fact and folklore. I'm Michael Willie, your guide on this ongoing expedition. Thanks so much for being with us today. And you know, fellow babies, there are a lot of podcasts out there. And the fact that you have chosen to spend some of your precious time with us here at Bigfoot Crossing really means a lot. Here at Bigfoot Crossing, we're trying to establish our footing amongst all these other podcasts and trying to build an audience, and, and you can help us with that. How? Well, spread the word about Bigfoot Crossing. Tell your coworkers. Tell the mailman. Tell the cop who gives you a speeding ticket. Heck, tell your wives and girlfriends. You know, the ladies really dig guys who are into Bigfoot. Really? No, but a guy can dream, right? Anyway, Bigfoot Crossing is available on seven, count them, seven platforms. Bigfoot Crossing is available on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Stitcher, and we are now available on Amazon Music and Overcast. And there's also the Bigfoot Crossing YouTube channel. Wow. Now we have two ways to navigate you to the YouTube channel. The old way, which is bit.ly slash Bigfoot Crossing. That's B-I-T dot L-Y slash Bigfoot dash crossing. But... We went out and got one of those newfangled YouTube handles. Now you can find the Bigfoot Crossing YouTube channel at youtube.com slash at BFC podcast. 
Yes, sir, you fellow babies, here at Bigfoot Crossing, we will spare no expense to stay on the cutting edge. But YouTube handles are free. Anyway, there are links on www.bigfootcrossing.net, so check it out. While you're on the website, be sure to visit the Bigfoot Crossing web store. <coughs> Shameless plug. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> And while we're on the subject of the Bigfoot Crossing web store, let me point out that there is a new arrival in the bookstore section. As I've mentioned before, a Canadian wildlife biologist and Bigfoot researcher and author John Bendernagel was my very first guest on the very first episode of the radio uh, version of Bigfoot Crossing. And unfortunately, Dr. Bendernagel passed away in 2018. But Dr. Bendernagel's dear friend Terence James has written Dr. Bendernagel's biography, and Hancock House has published it. Entitled Sasquatch Discovered, the biography of Dr. John Bendernagel, it is available on HancockHouse.com and at the Bigfoot Crossing web store with a 15% discount for fans of Bigfoot Crossing. Just be sure to use the coupon code BFC15, BFC15 when checking out. Now, the author, Terrence James, has agreed to be a guest on a future episode of Bigfoot Crossing, so be sure to check out his biography of the good Dr. Bendernagel. And while we're on the subject of books, my good friend and fellow Bigfoot researcher Matt Pruitt has just published his first book, entitled The Phenomenal Sasquatch, Seeking the Natural Origins of a Cultural Icon. Matt's book is the number one new release in Biology of Apes and Monkeys on Amazon. Now, knowing Matt's vast knowledge of all things Bigfoot and the hard work and long hours he put into writing this book, I can wholeheartedly recommend it to you as a valuable addition to your Bigfoot library. Now, Matt will be a guest on a future episode of Bigfoot Crossing, but his book is not available on the Bigfoot Crossing web store. <laughs> no sale. <laughs> Anyway, be sure to get your copy at Amazon today. You'll be glad you did. Now today we are going to discuss a watershed event in the history of Bigfoot, the publication in the Humboldt Times of the article about Jerry Crew's discovery and casting of large human-like footprints near Bluff Creek in Northern California. October 6th, 1958, a very slow news day. And class is in session. Now at this point, some questions may be swirling around in your head. Like, what the heck is a watershed event? Why does this article about Jerry Crew qualify? What is so important about this event? Why do you think it was a slow news day? What's for supper? So, before we launch into the details of the article, the events leading up to its publication, and the aftermath, we will answer those first four questions, because you've got some good questions bouncing around in your noggin. But if you are expecting me to find the answer to that last question, all I can do is quote Pirates of the Caribbean, The Curse of the Black Pearl, and tell you, my sympathies, friend, you've no manner of luck at all. Now for the first question. What the heck is a watershed event? Well, watershed has three definitions. There's the definition from geography that most of us may be somewhat familiar with, which is, quote, an area of high ground from which water flows down to a river, end quote. But did you know that in Great Britain, one of the definitions for watershed is, quote, the time in the evening, usually 9 p.m., when television programs that are not suitable for children may start to be shown, end quote. Now, I always loved the Benny Hill Show and, of course, Monty Python's Flying Circus. And I don't know for sure, but I would be willing to bet that both of those shows were watershed shows. <gasps> hey, buddy, keep it clean. 
Anyway, all these definitions come from the website for the Cambridge Dictionary, which is dictionary.cambridge.org. But the definition that we are interested in is, quote, an event or period that is important because it represents a big change in how people do or think about something. And fellow babies, let me tell you, the article published in the Humboldt Times definitely qualifies as a watershed moment in the history of Sasquatchery. Now, you think about it. What were Americans thinking about Bigfoot? prior to October 6th, 1958. Absolutely nothing. This article introduced the idea of large bipedal creatures roaming the forests of North America into the mainstream American culture and consciousness. And, and more than that, the article gave that forest giant a name. Aside from a few folks in Northern California, nobody had even heard of a creature called Bigfoot before October 6, 1958. This article introduced Bigfoot into American culture, into the vocabulary, and it has remained there ever since. Now, this was by no means the first article ever published about giant bipedal creatures in America's forests. Encounters with what were then called wild men of the woods had been reported in American newspapers uh, since the late 1700s. In the 1920s, J.W. Burns, a teacher on a First Nation reservation in British Columbia, single-handedly made Sasquatch a household word in that province and throughout Canada with his newspaper and magazine articles about native encounters with hairy giants. But this article, entitled Giant Footprints Puzzle Residents Along Trinity River, by Andrew Ginzoli, the regional editor of the Humboldt Times, was picked up by the wire services and captured the attention and imagination of America like nothing before it. That's why the publication of this article is so important. But it is also important because it was a catalyst for another event. In his book, Do Abominable Snowmen of America Really Exist?, Roger Patterson stated, quote, It all started, for me anyway, in December 1959 when True Magazine first startled America with a story about the unbelievable Bigfoot of the vast wilderness of Humboldt County in Northern California. I know for sure there was one American who was shocked, and that fellow was me. After reading the article, I was like most of my friends and thought it was so fantastic it was hard to believe. But the more I thought about it, the more interested and excited I became. Could such a story actually have happened in the 20th century? With that question ringing in my head, I set about to get some sort of an answer." End quote. The article in True Magazine that Patterson makes reference to is entitled The Strange Story of America's Abominable Snowman by Ivan T. Sanderson. Now, Sanderson, of course, was a famous biologist and one of the founders of cryptozoology. Sanderson's article was about the events near Bluff Creek, California, as reported in the Humboldt Times and based upon Sanderson's own investigations. Sanderson's article is reprinted in Patterson's book, as is the original Humboldt Times article. So, Roger Patterson was inspired to become a Bigfoot researcher by Ivan Sanderson's article in True Magazine. Sanderson, in turn, was inspired to investigate the Bluff Creek matter as a direct result of the original article in the Humboldt Times. One could make the argument that the Patterson-Gimlin film exists because Jerry Crew took those track casts and agreed to be interviewed by Andrew Ginzoli. I hate to think what would have happened if Jerry Crew had been worried about public perception. I've placed a, a picture of the front page of the Sunday, October 5th, 1958 Humboldt Times article uh, on the episode info page for this, uh, for this uh, episode. I have play, also placed links to Ivan Sanderson's writings about Bluff Creek there as well. Go to www.bigfootcrossing.net, click on the episode info link, and then click, click on the episode 6 link. And while you're on the site, be sure to check out 
the Bigfoot Crossing web store. And by the way, Roger Patterson's book, Do Abominable Snowmen of America Really Exist?, is available for purchase at HancockHouse.com and at the BFC web store with that special discount for podcast listeners. <coughs> Shameless plug. Anyway, now what about my contention that October 6, 1958 was a slow news day? Well, I think the fact that the wire services actually picked up a story from Podunk, Humboldt County, uh, is evidence of that. But let's look at some other dates for comparison purposes. So what if, instead of October 6, the Jerry Crew article had been put on the wire services on February 6, 1958? Well, what happened on February 6? Tragically, a plane crash in Munich, Germany, in which 23 people died, including eight members of the Manchester United soccer team. I'm convinced that this would have pushed Bigfoot right off the wire services. Or how about March 24, 1958, the day the media called Black Monday? What awful, terrible, no good thing happened on Black Monday? Hold on to your hats for this one. At the very height of his career on March 24, 1958, Elvis Presley was inducted into the U.S. Army. Now, Elvis had been uh, drafted on December 21, 1957, but was granted a one-time deferment of his induction while he finished up working on his movie King Creole. There is no way the wire services would have picked up a story about a guy in rural northern California with plaster foot casts when there was an Elvis story going on. Just would not have happened. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, so for comparison purposes again, let's look at the big news stories for October 5th and October 6th, 1958. According to OnThisDay.com on October 5th, 1958, the, uh, the day the article was first published in the Humboldt Times, KRTV Channel 3 in Great Falls, Montana begins broadcasting. The U.S. performed a uh, nuclear test at its Nevada test site, and the Soviet Union performed a nuclear test at its Novaya Zemlya test site. Now that's all I could find. Not exactly a banner day for big news stories. But the next day is even worse. The only news item listed for October 6, 1958 at OnThisDay.com is an item about the U.S. nuclear sub, the USS Seawolf, setting a record by remaining under the North Pole for 60 days. See what I mean? Now, I, I realize that America loves a good monster story, and once the wire services picked up that, uh, the story, the, that, that love of a monster story really drove its popularity. But there is no denying that the Jerry Crew article was picked up by the, uh, by the wire services for any other reason than October 5th and October 6th were very slow news days. And boy, am I glad things worked out the way they did. Now, before we jump into a review of the events at Bluff Creek in 1958... Uh, leading up to the publication of the article in the Humboldt Times and then the aftermath of, of the publication of that article, let me tell you a couple of things. First, there is a bibliography of the materials referenced for this episode uh, on the uh, website. Go to BigfootCrossing.net, click on the Episode Info button, and then click on the Episode 6 link. Now, where possible, I have included links to the actual articles. However, many of the articles referenced are uh, on subscription sites, such as newspapers.com. I have uh, still included those links because you can get a trial membership, like a seven-day trial membership to newspapers.com, so you could uh, view that, uh, those articles for that, uh, during that free seven-day trial period. And the articles that came from the Humboldt Times itself, I want to give a big shout out to Lauren in the research department at the Humboldt County Public Library. Uh, Lauren um, 
did a great job of tracking down articles for me uh, in the um, in the microfilm archives at the library, uh, and sometimes I. <laughs> I, I didn't make it easy on her. Sometimes I gave her the wrong title of the article. Sometimes I gave her the wrong publication date. But she persevered and found the articles that I was looking for and the articles that I needed. And uh, I just I, I will say that uh, this uh, this episode would not be possible without Lauren's work and research. And I appreciate it so much. So a big shout out and a big thank you to Lauren and the research department, or the reference department, rather, at the Humboldt County Public Library. And then secondly, a quick word of warning. For what is really a simple and straightforward event, a deep dive into it like we are doing today can get complex and convoluted because of later events. And because I want you to have a clear understanding of the events preceding the article and events flowing from the publication of the article, I will be pointing out items of importance to keep in mind as we travel down this path in history by playing this sound effect. So sit tight, listen carefully, and take notes because there might be a quiz. Just kidding. No quiz. I just really like that bell. Anyway, let's jump in. Bluff Creek is located in Humboldt County, California, up in the northwest corner of California. If you look at a county map of California, the county that's right up in the northwest corner of California is Del Norte County. Just below Del Norte County is Humboldt County. And in the 1950s, the U.S. Forest Service decided to have a timber access road built in the Bluff Creek area. Now, there were already roads of, of a sort in the area, but the Forest Service decided it wanted to improve upon that situation. John Green, in his book, Sasquatch the Apes Among Us, gives us an idea of both the traveling conditions in the Bluff Creek area and the difficulties encountered in building this road. Mr. Green writes, quote, The Bluff Creek Valley runs approximately north from the Klamath River, starting about four miles northeast of the tiny town of Weichpeck. In 1958, Highway 96 along the Klamath was little more than a one-lane road. Unpaved, but there were several forest access roads running north and west from it, mainly high up on the ridges. The new road up Bluff Creek was not penetrating any unknown territory, but it entered an area completely wild, completely buried in closed canopy forest, and completely uninhabited. The Bluff Creek Road was to be different from the others, wider, with better grades, staying more in the bottom of the valley. It was to provide access to the timber in the area and was eventually to link up with Highway 199. It later turned out that the hillside was unstable and after a series of huge slides, much of the road was eventually abandoned. End quote. That's Sasquatch the Apes Among Us, pages 65 and 66. Now, John Green's book is available for purchase at HancockHouse.com and at the Bigfoot Crossing web store with that special discount for podcast listeners. <coughs> Shameless plug. Anyway, I think, though, that Marion T. Place gives a much more vivid description of the driving conditions. This is from her book, On the Track of Bigfoot, pages 21 and 22. Quote, the road which follows Bluff Creek into the hinterland is called a timber access road. It was constructed primarily for logging trucks, which haul logs from sections where the United States Forest Service permits timber to be harvested. The logs are transported to sawmills in the area. The road is also used by forest fighting crews when necessary and by hunters and fishermen. 
The lower water level segment of the road is surfaced with gravel and is wide enough for trucks to pass. Farther on, it climbs in zigzag fashion with sharp switchbacks until it pinches down to a rutted one-way track gouged into the mountainside. Logging truck drivers are accustomed to driving roads like that. Sportsmen in four-wheel drive vehicles bump and grind along uncomplainingly because the road leads deep into the country where deer, elk, and bear still outnumber the hunters. But to freeway drivers and city folk, the upper reachers of the Bluff Creek Road are nerve-wracking. End quote. Sounds like a lovely commute. But the U.S. Forest Service, in conjunction with the California Public Works Department, for some reason decided a new road was needed. The road building work was contracted out to Block and Company, who in turn subcontracted the work out to Wallace Brothers Construction, which was owned by a fellow named Ray Wallace. But before you can build a road, the trees have to be cleared, and that work was contracted out to the Granite Logging Company. Marion T. Place gives us a succinct description of the work that went on at Bluff Creek. Quote, Construction on the Bluff Creek Road began in 1957. Ray Wallace, a contractor, employed a crew of about 30 men, including several Hoopa Indians who were experienced loggers. The first task was to cut down the huge trees blocking the proposed roadway. After the logs were hauled out, a man operating a bulldozer gouged out the stumps and undergrowth and leveled a rough swath through the forest. Then the crew moved in with machinery to construct the actual road. End quote. Mrs. Place tells us that by the time work stopped for the winter, the crew had completed 10 miles of road work, and that's again from On the Track of Bigfoot, pages 22 and 23. Now, let me pause here and tell you that due to the remoteness of the work, uh, of the work site, uh, the men hired to build this new Bluff Creek Road lived at the construction site during the work week. As Mrs. Place explains, quote, During the week, the crew lived at campsites set up near the advancing head of the road. When work shut down on Friday afternoons, the men returned for the weekend to their homes at Happy Camp, Weichpeck, Willow Creek, and other settlements, end quote. On the track of Bigfoot, page 23. Ivan T. Sanderson clarifies, though, that not everyone went home for the weekend. Sanderson writes, those, quote, those employed on this work live during the week in camps near the roadhead. Some have their families with them and stay there all week. Others go home to nearby communities on Friday nights and return on the following Monday morning, end quote. That's a quote from the True Magazine article we discussed uh, earlier. In his book, uh, Sasquatch Legend Meets Science, author Jeff Meldrum cites Ed Schillinger, who worked on the Bluff Creek site as a stake setter, and states, quote, there was always someone there, nights and weekends, end quote. Jeff Meldrum's excellent book, Sasquatch Legend Meets Science, is available on Amazon.com, but is not available at the BFC web store. No sale. So, so the workers lived in, on site in what we would call primitive conditions. I have no doubt, fellow babies, that the first things built on this work site were the foreman's shack and the outhouse. Not necessarily in that order. Remember, porta potties did not come into existence until the 1960s. You also need to remember that in the event of an accident, the crew was at least two hours away from medical assistance. This remote, rugged work environment, uh, coupled with being required to live on site and be separated from loved ones, created an employee retention problem for the contractor, Ray Wallace. And so it was that when work resumed in the spring of 1958, after the snow had melted and the mud dried, that Ray Wallace fielded a crew comprised of veterans from the 1957 work season and newcomers. And one of the newcomers was heavy equipment operator Jerry Crew. 
So the crew picked up where they had left off in 1957, with Granite Logging Company clearing the trees and Jerry Crew following the loggers in his job as the cat skinner. <laughs> oh, now, now perhaps I should explain that the job of cat skinner has nothing to do with the skinning of actual cats. <sighs> As far as I know, no cats were harmed in the building of the Bluff Creek Road. The cat skinner, Jerry Crew in this case in 1958, is the person who follows the loggers on his bulldozer, gouging out the tree stumps and leveling out a rough roadbed so that the rest of the crew can follow the cat skinner and begin the process of actually building the road. The cat skinner is often as much as a quarter of a mile ahead of the rest of the crew. Both Marion T. Place and Ivan Sanderson take great pains to point out that Jerry Crew went home every weekend because of his deep commitment to his family and their involvement in church and community activities. They both also describe Crew as a man of character and integrity. Sanderson is especially effusive in his description of Crew. Uh, in the True Magazine article, Sanderson says of Jerry Crew, quote, He is an active member of the Baptist Church, a teetotaler, and I have talked to enough people up there to state flatly that his reputation for honesty, level-headedness, and just plain common sense is an excellent one, end quote. In his book, Abominable Snowmen, Legend Come to Life, at page 124, Sanderson has this to say about Jerry Crew, quote, a very sane and sober citizen, an active member of the Baptist Church, a teetotaler, and a man with a reputation in his community that can only be described as heroic in the face of certain almost unique personal tragedy." End quote. Now Sanderson certainly was not exaggerating when he wrote about Jerry Crew's personal tragedy. After a bit of research, I discovered that Jerry's wife died in 1955, as a result of burns received in a fire at home. Forty years old in 1958, Jerry was a widower and a single parent to four children ranging in age from 6 to 14. Clearly, Jerry Crew was a man of character and integrity and deserving of the praise that uh, Sanderson and Marion T. Place heaped upon him. Now, Jerry, because he did live at the work site during the week, would drive his truck up to where he'd left his bulldozer the night before. And uh, on Wednesday, August 27th, 1958, he drove straight to his dozer and parked his truck. Walking to the dozer from his truck, Jerry noticed some tracks in the, in the dirt, but didn't apparently really pay any attention to them, assuming they were bear tracks. But from the bird's eye view afforded him from atop his bulldozer, Jerry was astonished to discover that the tracks weren't bear tracks at all. As Marion T. Place tells us at page 25 of On the Track of Bigfoot, not until Jerry, quote, climbed onto the seat of the big rig did he observe a line of footprints approaching the dozer, circling it, and continuing on down the outer edge of the raw roadway. Puzzled, he leaned over and from his high seat gazed straight down onto the nearest tracks. One long, hard stare told him they most certainly had not been made by a bear. The tracks were not only larger than anything he had ever seen in years of hunting big game, they were unmistakably those of a human foot." End quote. Jerry jumped down from the dozer to inspect the tracks and was startled by the depth of the tracks compared to his own footprints. The tracks were two inches deep, with Crew noting that his footprints were only a half inch deep in the same soil. Jerry's thoughts went immediately to the possibility of a hoax, either by an outsider or co-workers. I need to stop and point out here at this, at this stage of the construction, the road had left the floor of the valley and the workers were blazing a trail up the face of the mountain. The previous practice of moving the campsite to follow the advancing roadhead had been abandoned. Still, though, an outsider coming to this remote work site to leave prank footprints in the dirt would have to pass the camp unseen in order to reach the roadhead where Jerry had parked the dozer. 
As a result, Jerry dismissed the possibility of an outsider hoaxing footprints. Then Jerry also dismissed the possibility of a prank by co-workers because, as Sanderson stated in the True Magazine article, although Jerry's co-workers, quote, liked a harmless joke as much as any man, he knew they were far too tired to go clomping around in the dark after the sort of working day they put in on that job. Making silly footprints around the equipment, end quote. Besides, as Marion T. Place points out on page 27 of On the Track of Bigfoot, quote, crew realized, breaking out in goose pimples again, that there were only two sets of tracks visible, the Bigfooted ones and his own, end quote. Then Jerry decided to investigate further. In the True Magazine article, Sanderson describes the area in which the road is being built. Quote, the country is extremely mountainous. As a matter of fact, in most places it is almost vertical, so that you can only go up on all fours or down on your bottom, end quote. For this reason, Jerry was shocked to find, as Sanderson recounts in the uh, True Magazine article, quote, that the tracks came almost straight down an incline at about a 75-degree angle onto the road ahead of the parked cat, then proceeded down the road to one side, circled the machine, and finally went down toward the camp. Before getting there, however, they cut across the road and went straight down an even steeper incline and continued into the forest with a measured stride that varied only when an obstacle had to be stepped over or a bank was so steep a purchase had to be obtained with the heels only." End quote. The tracks were 16 inches long and 7 inches wide. The length of the stride varied from 45 to 60 inches. So Jerry hopped in his truck to go tell the foreman about his find. Now the foreman is Wilbur Wallace, brother to Ray Wallace, the contractor, or the subcontractor. Marion T. Place tells us that when Jerry reached the foreman's shack, there was a group of workers there waiting to be transported to the section of road where they were going to be working that day. When Jerry reported his track find, most of the employees seemed indifferent and Jerry was relieved to, uh, that no one laughed. Wilbur asked the Hoopa Indians who were present if they'd ever seen tracks similar to what Jerry had found, and they indicated that they had not. Then another employee spoke up. Mrs. Place tells us, quote, But the man who operated the road grading machine said that as long as he could remember, folks had been seeing or hearing about monster-sized footprints. Matter of fact, he added, some other tracks had been discovered months earlier along the Mad River, 40 miles west of Willow Creek. The poor logger who reported them was ridiculed until he showed friends the tracks. When they saw them and discovered additional prints elsewhere along the stream bank, they apologized for laughing, end quote. And that quote is from page 30 of On the Track of Bigfoot. The Mad River worksite was another one of Ray Wallace's worksites. This discussion reminded Wilbur of three other startling events. As Sanderson details it in his book, Abominable Snowmen, Legend Come to Life, quote, First, it was reported to him by one of his men that a nearly full 55-gallon drum of diesel fuel, which had been left standing beside the road, was missing, and that Bigfoot tracks led down the road from a steep bank to the spot where it had stood, then crossed the road and continued down the hill, and finally went over the lower bank and away into the bush. Will Wallace went to inspect and found the tracks exactly as the men had stated. He also found the oil drum at the bottom of a steep bank about 175 feet from the road. It had rolled down this bank and had apparently been thrown from the top. What is more, it had been lifted up from its original resting place and apparently carried to this point, for there were no marks in the soft mud of its either having been rolled or dragged all that distance. 
Second, a length of 18-inch galvanized steel culvert disappeared from a dump overnight and was found at the bottom of another bank some distance away. Third, he reported a wheel with tire for a carry-all earth mover weighing over 700 pounds had likewise been in part lifted and in part rolled a quarter of a mile down the road and hurled into a deep ravine, end quote. Now let me pause here to point out that the incident with the fuel drum uh, took place in 1957, just months after construction had started. Based upon Marion T. Place's book, the incident with the culvert occurred in 1958, and the uh, tire incident took place about two weeks prior to Jerry Crew's discovery of the footprints around his dozer. Picking up the story at page 33 of On the Track of Bigfoot, Mrs. Place writes, quote, The workmen eyed each other. They remembered the struggle to retrieve the big tire. They also recalled how they had swallowed the foreman's story that some vandals had pushed it off the road. And again, when a heavy section of steel culvert was found at the bottom of a steep drop-off, the boss had blamed that on vandals too. If vandals weren't to blame, who was? The foreman grinned and shrugged his shoulders, end quote. Mrs. Place tells us that after some further discussion, Wilbur asks the men to get to work, which they did. I bet you're wondering what happened next, aren't you? Yeah! Well, that's what we're going to be talking about in our next episode. What? That's right, fellow babies. That's another episode in the can. Join us right here at Bigfoot Crossing for our next episode, part two of October 6, 1958, a very slow news day. All right, fellow babies, there's the bell. Thanks so much for being with us here today at Bigfoot Crossing. Now get out of here. We hope you have enjoyed your visit with us here at Bigfoot Crossing. The internet home for Bigfoot Crossing can be found at www.bigfootcrossing.net. Michael Willie's website, Bigfoot in Tennessee, can be found at www.tnbigfoot.net. Please follow us on Facebook at Bigfoot Tennessee. You can also follow Michael Willie on Twitter. His handle is at Michael B. Willie. Each episode of Bigfoot Crossing is posted to the Bigfoot Crossing YouTube channel. Please subscribe so you can be notified when new episodes are posted. Your feedback is always welcome. Please email questions and comments to tnsasquatch at gmail.com. Be sure to let us know which episode you have a question or comment about. Thanks for joining us today. We look forward to seeing you next time right here at Bigfoot Crossing. This is Brock Whitmore, live on the scene. Sir, did you see what happened? Yeah, did.